Hey, real quick, I wanted to take some time to thank all the new subscribers and to apologize about the lack of content in the last two months. This video took roughly 500 hours to produce since I decided to take it upon myself to colorize over 100 old photos from this conflict. Also, since it's an obscure topic, it was very hard to find good footage and sources about this war. I hope you'll agree with me that it was worth all the extra work. Anyways, if you enjoy this kind of content, please subscribe. It's free and literally the best way you can help me out right now. With that being said, I hope you enjoy the show. The following is intended only for mature audiences. Viewer discretion advised. Hey, hey, people. Raz here. Why Africa? Well, like all good stories, ours has a beginning. Our journey will lead us to the ancient Christian kingdom of Abyssinia or Ethiopia as it's known now. Today, we're going to explore one of the most interesting conflicts you've never heard of. Today, we're going to begin the Second Italo-Abyssinian War. So, if I could pick one event and say it was the reason there was an African campaign at all, it would be the Second Italo-Abyssinian War. As usual, old tragedies in this world can be blamed on one nation. I'm of course talking about the French. Our story begins with this man. Wait, no, this man. In the year 1798, Napoleon conquered Egypt. This would open a Pandora's box sparking slavery on an industrial scale, colonization, and empire building. The latter half of the 1800s would be known as the Scramble for Africa. Napoleon unearthed the ruins of ancient Egypt while on his warpath and in doing so sparked an international craze for Egyptian culture and architecture. I think the best way to understand this is by looking at this map of Africa made in 1805. You can see how much was still unknown at the time. Africa became one of the last great frontiers for Europeans, a land of mystery, adventure, and wealth. Seeing the riches that laid in Africa, the other European nations realized that this godforsaken wasteland actually had valuable gold, salt, and spice. Pure, unrefined spice. As the European nations slowly realized they had unlocked the next tech tree before the Africans, pretty much every European power and the U.S. would spend the 1800s pillaging and colonizing the continent. Then, the 1860s happened. In the sunny Pacific, a young naturalist took a trip to the Galapagos Islands. His theory of evolution would set the world on fire. Only one problem, though. The racists decided they wanted to use it, too. Europeans bastardized Darwin's theory of evolution and came up with their own theory, known as the white man's burden. I shit you not, the common belief at the time was that the Europeans who had just experienced an industrial revolution were superior to all the other races because they were more advanced. <laughs> Therefore, it was their burden to civilize all these other races and teach them the ways of the white man. This would result in the near extermination of Native Americans, the colonization of Africa and the Pacific, and the decimation of Imperial China. Many future world leaders growing up in this period would form their own versions of communism, capitalism, fascism, and socialism around this ideology. A new theory called social Darwinism started to emerge. It would see the regular working man being exploited by big business and governments around the world. African Americans in the U.S. would be treated like second-class citizens living under Jim Crow laws. China would be exploited through mass drug addiction. Smoke weed every day. Most of Africa, the Pacific, the Middle East, India, and South America were divided into spheres of influence where only certain nations were allowed to colonize and govern them. Uh, Mr. Raz, what in God's name does this have to do with World War II? Well, in 1861, Italy formed into one nation. At this point, they were way behind in the Empire game. 
They wanted to play with the big boys, and they decided the only way to have a seat at the negotiation table was to have colonies of their very own. They set their sights on several places in particular, Eritrea, Somalia, Libya, and Abyssinia. You see, unlike all other major African kingdoms Abyssinia had held out, they had a strong history, writing, a semi-modern military, and were recognized as civilized because they already worshipped Christ. Because of this, pretty much everyone left them alone, except for Italy. Italy wanted more land, and after some major border disputes where Italy just started straight up attacking Abyssinia, tensions were high. Abyssinia was understandably angry, but decided to broker a treaty using Britain as the middleman. This was called the Treaty of Wicall. However, Italian Prime Minister Francisco Crispi had other plans. Crispi decided they were going to pull a sneaky on the Abyssinians, and I shit you not, in some Bugs Bunny-esque level trickery, they drafted two separate treaties and convinced King Manalik of Abyssinia to sign both. The Abyssinian Treaty, written in Amharic, said that the Abyssinians would gain access to the Red Sea coast and Eritrea, which was all good and well for them. Except the second treaty, written in Italian, essentially put Abyssinia under the sphere of influence of Italy, and said they were their protectorate and any diplomatic and trade negotiations had to be approved by Italy. Understandably, this pissed off the Abyssinians, and they refused to follow these rules. Sera. This caused Italy to start peer pressuring Abyssinia using shotgun diplomacy. The Italians started to mass along their borders, and in 1894, the first Italo Abyssinian War began. Long story short, the Italians only thought it would take 20,000 men to capture Abyssinia. Unfortunately for them, King Manalik was able to raise an army of 200,000 warriors over half of which were freshly supplied with Russian rifles. Over the next two years, Italy would suffer defeat after defeat, and finally capitulated after their forces were effectively destroyed in the Battle of Adowa. This was absolutely humiliating for Italy. Italian Prime Minister Crispi resigned in embarrassment, and would die in embarrassment. <laughs> Press F! Needless to say, Italy was severely embarrassed by the whole situation. Humiliated, this caused Italy to retire from big conflicts until World War I. And you all remember how well that went. In 1922, when Benito Mussolini came to power, he vowed to establish the Second Roman Empire. He saw the Mediterranean as an Italian lake, and vowed to reclaim all of Italy's lost colonies. Mussolini wanted to correct their past blunders, and decided he would start by invading Abyssinia. This time, they would be prepared, though. Learning from the mistakes of their past, Italy began working on its navy and air force. They wanted to ensure they had everything they would need to make this a quick war. Italy produced almost 800 tanks, 2,000 artillery pieces, and raised an army of 500,000 men. On October 3rd, 1935, Mussolini sent a little welcoming party. As in, welcome to sunny Italy, you're now part of the empire and refusing to join is not an option. Marshal Emilia de Bono marched 200,000 troops from Eritrea into northern Abyssinia. He captured Adigrat and Ottawa with light resistance. The new king of Abyssinia, Haile Selassie, was outraged and immediately went to the League of Nations to get help. To stop other European nations from stepping in, de Bono declared the freedom of all captured slaves. He knew that doing this would stop the democracies from intervening because they were all mostly anti-slave countries at this time, and it would be really awkward to support a slaveholding state after freeing all your own slaves. De Bono also hoped doing this would rally freed slaves into his military and help bolster his forces. Unfortunately, the League of Nations knew this was a ploy and imposed sanctions on Italy. This made Mussolini very persistent that the war needed to be done as soon as possible. Undaunted by this, De Bono slowly ambled his forces into Ashub. Due to supply issues, De Bono told Mussolini he wanted to take time to build a row from Ashub to Eritrea to help get supplies there faster. Mussolini's response was, No! God, please, no! 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 The slow progress of De Bono was really pissing Mussolini off at this point. He wanted this war over as quickly as possible before the sanctions shut down the entire Italian economy. To help speed things up, Mussolini authorized the use of mustard gas since he knew the Abyssinians had very few gas masks. Mussolini claimed that since the Abyssinians were using hollow point bullets, which were outlawed by the Hague Convention, he had the right to use gas since the rules no longer applied. This further angered the League of Nations. Italy would dip out of the League of Nations by 1937, which showed the League's weakness to all the other world powers since they were virtually unable to do anything but make hollow threats to Italy. 
During all this, Britain and France were meeting with Italy in secret to propose the Hor Laval plan. This agreement would see the best parts of Abyssinia ceded to the Italians so they would make peace with Abyssinia. Somehow, the plan got leaked to the Abyssinians who were outraged since they were not part of the negotiations that would see their country divvied up. This was such a scandal that it degraded the respect of the League of Nations and the other countries started to see how powerless the League truly was at stopping aggressive nations like Italy. Mussolini knew this needed to be a quick war to keep the other European powers at bay. He fired De Bono and appointed Marshal Petro Badoglio as the new leader of the Italian Expeditionary Force. Since most of the gas reserves were in neighboring Somalia, Mussolini wanted to open up a southern flank before the year was over. Attacking from the south, Rudolfo Graziani marched from the southern coast of Italian Somaliland into the southeastern part of Abyssinia. To keep Addis Ababa from getting surrounded, Haile Selassie launched his Christmas offensive to test these new Italian commanders. In response to the new Christmas offensive and the killing of the pilot Tito Minietti, the Italians waged a total war. They started unrestricted gas attacks and bombings of every village in their path, and also started burning crops and confiscating farm animals to cut off the local food supply. Ali Selassie appealed to the League of Nations, but his cries fell on deaf ears. On January 7th, the Battle of Ganaldoria would break up the momentum of his Christmas offensive. Marshal Graziani counterattacked the advancing troops of Rostes at Damtu. Embarrassingly, the rough terrain in the area stopped the tanks dead in their tracks, and the Abyssinians were able to creep up on them and fire through the bucelets to kill their crew. Several tanks were captured and turned against the Italians because of this tactic. After more than three days of slaughter, the Abyssinians broke and fled. Marshal Graziani would go on to capture Nigeli Baron. And then, Badoglio started the First Battle of Tambien, which effectively brought the Ethiopian Christmas Offensive to an end. Refusing to be pushed back, the Ethiopians under Ras Malageta defended the heights and passes of northern Abyssinia in the Battle of Amba Aradam. The Italians opened up with a massive artillery barrage, and then the Black Shirts led a charge up the hills. They were able to raise the flag on Amber Aradam that day, but they took severe losses from the Abyssinian machine gunners. You see, Haile Selassie wanted the Italians to think the Abyssinians were unequipped savages. In fact, their army had tanks, anti-aircraft guns, mortars, machine guns, cannons, and at least 20,000 professionally trained soldiers. The battle ended with the Ethiopians being defeated with heavy losses, including Ras Malageta and his son. The left and right flanks retreated, however, the Abyssinian forces still held the heights around Tambien. Marshal Badoglio sent 250 planes to chase after the retreating forces. They bombed Red Cross aid stations, flattened any village aiding the soldiers, and gassed as many Abyssinians as they could. In some areas, the ground was so toxic the retreating forces could not walk there, since many of them did not have shoes, and the gas would soak into the dirt and cause horrible blisters or burns to appear on your body if it touched your skin. Next, the Abyssinians were defeated in the Second Battle of Tambien, leaving few survivors from the armies of Roscasa and Rossam. In this battle, they chose to defend the mountains, however, since they did not have a way to dig in, the Italian Air Force made easy targets of them, and gassed and bombed the mountain peaks, leaving many no escape route. 8,000 died due to the lack of cover in the area. Most of the survivors were then mopped up by the Alpini who went in after the gas had cleared out. The Italians would go on to use the same tactic in the Battle of Shair. Knowing of what happened in Tabien, the forces retreated off the heights and while they were crossing the Takeza River, the Italian Air Force swooped in and did a low altitude gas run and dropped over 80 tons of firebombs on their forces. 4,000 men suffocated or were cooked alive with no escape route, and it effectively destroyed Ras Emeru's army. At this point, things were not looking good for the Abyssinians, so they tried to open up negotiations with Italy again. Haile Selassie begged for more sanctions, international army support, and the condemnation of Italy for gas attacks, civilian massacres, and the bombings of Red Cross detachments in Abyssinia. In response to this, the Italians raised the stakes and started firebombing Harar. Haile Selassie raised his forces for a defense at Mechu. They gathered in the mountains overlooking the Italians. As the Italians moved into the heights, the Abyssinians rained machine gun and mortar fire down on them. It had a devastating effect on the Alpini who were charging in straight lines with next to no cover. After an unsuccessful attack, the Italians withdrew to their fortified positions. Selassie knew they were waiting for the sky to clear so they could call in the bombers. 
Because of this, he chose to attack while it was overcast, even though his army was outnumbered 2 to 1. He ordered his men to do a war chant to intimidate the Italians. Then he called for a massive downhill charge against the Italian positions. The fighting was fierce and it resulted in a bloody melee. Many of the Abyssinians were trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat from a young age, so the Italians had an extremely tough fight. Sadly, the Italian machine guns created a crossfire which mowed down many of their forces before they were able to reach their lines. They were completely repelled and nearly all of Selassie's commanders were killed in the assault since they chose to lead from the front. With no leadership, the Abyssinian forces crumbled and started running back to the capital at Addis Ababa. Soon the clouds broke and the Italian air force started chasing after the retreating Abyssinians. Thousands were killed by low-level gas attacks. They also gassed Lake Ashangi, which destroyed the retreating army's water supply. At this point, the entire Abyssinian army was in disarray. There was no organized retreat, it was every man for himself. When they got back to the capital at Addis Ababa, it was a scene of pure chaos. Law and order had broke down. Everywhere, there were riots, looting, and shooting in the streets. The last of the remaining Abyssinian leadership rallied together a few hundred men to lead raids on the Italian units as they came closer and closer to the highlands. The rest of the war would be mostly guerrilla mountain skirmishes waged in the rocky heartland of Abyssinia. Raid after raid would hit the Italian forces. These tactics prevented the Air Force from overwhelming them since they were small targets of only a few hundred men. Then it happened. On the 26th of April, the Italian forces began an attack known as the March of the Iron Will, and for 10 days and nights, the Italian army marched over 200 miles into the heart of Abyssinia. In a massive show of force, they mounted everything they had into a column of trucks, tanks, and thousands of men and marched to the capital of Addis Ababa. When they arrived, white flags were on display everywhere, and the capital gave up without a fight. What was left of the Ethiopian army and government fled to Horde. There, they would hide and form an underground resistance to the Italian occupation. The resistance would courageously fight on. On May 9, 1936, Benito Mussolini placed a crown on Victor Emmanuel's head and declared him an emperor, further solidifying the fascist hold over Italy and legitimizing Mussolini as the dictator that would restore Italy to its former glory. Before the Italians arrived in Addis Ababa, Haile Selassie flew to the League of Nations to address them personally. In a grim prediction of the future, he said, It is us today, and it will be you tomorrow. However, this is not the end of this story. Soon, a tale of liberation will unfold for the kingdom of Abyssinia. Anyways, on to the review. But first, let's see what gifts God King Kobe has for us today. <laughs> well, this is just weed. Holy shit, that's a lot of weed. Fun fact, the Rastafarian religious movement was started by Marcus Garvey and Leonard Howell in the 1930s. Rastafarianism formed as a result of the Back to Africa movement in which many Americans were looking for a reason to send African Americans who had lived literally their entire life in a different country back to Africa because that's where their descendants were from. Because of this, black nationalists like Marcus Garvey believed that churches had been controlled by white people for too long and wanted to find a new black way to worship. He wanted a purely black Christian experience. Most Jamaicans were Christian, and since Abyssinia was the ancient Orthodox Christian kingdom, they saw it as the promised land they should return to, and the religion they should emulate. The Rastas believed that black people were the chosen people of God and one of the forgotten tribes of Israel. They also believed that Jesus would come again to save them and take them back to their holy land because of a prophecy Marcus Garvey had postulated. He said, look to Africa when a black king shall be crowned, for the day of deliverance is at hand. Because of this prophecy, many Rastas saw Haile Selassie as the second coming of Jesus. Selassie's title was Rastafari Makonan. Ras meaning head, Tafari meaning duke, and Makonan being the province he was from. When Haile Selassie assumed the throne, he was said to have divine blood due to his direct descendants from the biblical queen of Sheba who ruled over Abyssinia in the time of the Bible. This was the main reason Abyssinia was one of the early adopters of Christianity, and why Haile Selassie is seen as the second coming of Jesus Christ. Selassie embraced this since he was a religious man himself and did a lot to support the movement. He even created a plot of land they could return to if they so wished. Many Rastas still live there till this very day. In 1966, Haile Selassie visited Kingston, Jamaica by plane. He was astounded by the crowd. The largely Rastafarian Jamaican population had flooded the tarmac so much that Selassie could barely get off the plane. Tens of thousands of people attended the event to see Selassie in person. In that crowd was Rita Anderson. 
She claims to have seen the stigmata on Haile Selassie's hand when he waved to the crowd. The stigmata are marks of Christ's crucifixion, which would include marks on the hands, feet, or ribs, which would mirror the wounds Jesus received while he was on the cross. She was so profoundly moved by what she saw that day, she convinced her boyfriend, Bob Marley, to convert to Rastafarianism. Ganja, or marijuana, is seen as a pillar of the Rastafarian faith. And they said when Selassie visited, it was smoked so freely and so heavily that everyone in the crowd had a contact high from the cloud of weed smoke hovering in the air that day, which is objectively hilarious. Bob Marley would go on to spread his faith around the world through his music. More songs than I can list here are about Ethiopia, Rastafarianism, or the Iron Zion Lion himself, Haile Selassie. Anyways, on to the review. Last episode, I asked you, the people, to vote. And you wanted the Strum Panzer too. Being a man of my word, I'll allow it, even though it has absolutely nothing to do with this run of the war. The Strum Panzer II was the derpiest of all German tanks. It was considered such a failure that only 12 were made. It was created in a fit of anger. Rommel was pissed that the 15cm artillery piece his army relied on took 6 horses and 9 men to operate. Logistically, feeding that many horses in a desert was a nightmare. Also, the half-tracks were tied down hauling the heavier cannon, so he angrily demanded the German military find a motorized solution. Not wanting to argue with Rommel, because believe me, you don't do that. The German Panzer Development Branch said, well, we have a shitload of Panzer IIs we're not using. So, they extended the chassis and mounted a cannon to it. It only required four men to operate and seemed to meet Rommel's requirements, so they sent them to Africa to test. To start out, some of the vehicles arrived in such a rough shape from the ride that they couldn't be moved and had to wait for parts to get their engines repaired. Unfortunately, after all the testing they did in Europe, they failed to notice that the engine was too small to support the excess weight of the gun, and because of this, it was prone to overheating. The manual indicated the back engine flaps needed to be open while driving to prevent the engine from overheating. Unfortunately, doing this caused sand to enter the engine and would lead to, you guessed it, even more parts damage. I don't like sand. The overheating was so bad that some days the tank would only be able to run for 15 minutes at a time. In some cases, driving this tank 70 kilometers would cause the engine to get cracks and parts of the transmission to fail. In the end, most of these were abandoned due to constant breakdowns and the inability to transport them to a repair depot. The German Panzer development arm learned a lot from this and would use this to great effect when developing mobile howitzers for the Eastern Front. But enough about the history, let's talk about the model. This is one of those models I have very mixed feelings about. It looks great, but it is extremely delicate. There's almost no playability with the gun, and it's incredibly hard to put back together when it breaks. The little wing flaps on the side of the cannon are so delicate and hard to reach, it's impossible for my large American hands to fix it. While the average pole may only have hands smaller than 20 centimeters, an American like me struggles when the small pieces break off like this. This model also has a lot of issues with the gun and detailing pieces falling off when they get bumped slightly. The minifig has these awful new goggles that Kobe came out with. I have a ton of issues getting these goggles to stay on, and they are constantly falling down the face or around the neck of the minifigs. Also, the tank itself is too big against the minifigs, making it look giant since it's not built to the golden ratio of 135th scale. On the plus side, it rolls really well and is a great parts donor if you build box like I do. Lastly, it's very well detailed and looks good on a shelf if you're just going to display it. Unfortunately, I can't recommend this set for kids due to its lack of playability, however, if you're a mock builder like me, it's great. So far, I bought four of these now due to the amount of large angled pieces and specialty detailing pieces this set has. It's probably the third best parts donor for tan pieces right after the Abrams and Panzer IV. All in all, I can't recommend buying this in good conscience unless you plan to tear it up to build mocks. At the end of the day, I'm giving this set a 4 out of 10. Anyways, I hope you've enjoyed today's review. Don't forget to vote on which review you'd like to see next in the comments. Until then, I have more mock videos, more reviews, and a few special surprises coming up, so stay tuned. As usual, you're all truly wonderful. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.
sayonara ben. 